We now have 89 with the two robots, 36 to 38 liters per cow. Here in this system, we have two production groups, one of multi-paris cows and another of primi-paris cows. They chose the free stall system where the cows have the space we consider ideal. In this way, they defecate outside the bedding, which makes cleaning management much easier. When the cow enters the milking booth, the first process is the application of pre-dipping. After the application, each teat is individually cleaned. The Heck family barn currently has space for 140 cows. Currently, they do not have all 140 cows in milking, but they want to grow, which is why they work with two robots. On the panel, the production of each teat during milking is shown, among other information provided. Welcome to the Santa Fe Institute channel. Today I am at Heck Farm, a farm that uses a robotic milking system. And Camilla, the owner, is going to talk a little about this system and the history of this farm. Please, Camilla, introduce yourself. Hello, everyone. My name is Camilla. I am a descendant of the Heck family. My grandparents started here with the farm. They started with a few cows and gradually increased until we reached robotic milking. Camilla, tell us a bit about your story and how you started. The barn was already built to install the robotic milking. We built it last year, in June. The first robot started working at the end of August last year. The second robot was added in September last year. And since then, we have been increasing production and the number of cows. How many cows do you have today? We now have 89 with the two robots. With an average of how many liters? 36 to 38 liters per cow. What difficulties have you experienced with the system and in which areas are you looking for improvements? Well, the biggest difficulty has been adapting to the system. We have to work according to the cow's daily routine. Before, we were very involved in manual management in the milking parlor. Now, with robotic milking, we don't have labor problems. The work is excellent. And has that helped you? Before robotic milking, what type of milking did you have? It was a fishbone milking, the normal kind. We milked six cows on each side and we spent an hour and a half, two hours, four hours a day in the milking pit. Every day, all year round? Yes, every day at the same time, which was complicated to maintain. Not always do people have the same mood and that's difficult. I think the biggest challenge on all dairy farms is labor. It's complicated to find people who don't get sick, don't ask for vacations. Now, we don't have that problem anymore. We work with a couple and we are very satisfied. And how has the quality of milk and production changed with the robotic milking system? The quality of the milk has improved a lot. For about four or five months, we haven't exceeded 300,000 somatic cells. This is an excellent result that we have achieved over time, discarding animals with a high somatic cell count and improving the quality of the milk. That's excellent. And for you, as the farm owners, how has your quality of life changed with this system? Our quality of life has improved significantly. We no longer have to adhere to strict schedules or perform strenuous manual labor. Now, we manage the work through the system. That's very good. So you put aside force to focus more on data and computer use, and did this data make things clearer for you? How is it to have this more precise information? Certainly, we were able to have more clarity in the data because in the milking pit, I used to do milk control once a month. But now I have this information daily, by teat, by production, by cow. Definitely, this is one of the greatest qualities of the robot because before I didn't have this. Now we have all the information at our fingertips. And how did you seek the knowledge to start operating with the robot? Because it was all very new, something that is a bit harder to obtain. But how did you adapt and learn? At the beginning, we had even planned the project for the milking parlor, the waiting room, everything here in the barn. Some people told us that their relatives had installed a robotic milking system in a nearby city. So we thought, why don't we go and see? We went to visit, asked about the price and everything else, and we were surprised that it wasn't as expensive as we thought. We believed it was something very distant for us. We started researching, talked to the company to see the brand. We visited other farms that also had robots, talked to them, and we loved the system. And after that, we continued with that dream. I understand. So to operate the robot, you visited some farms and learned day by day. At the beginning, what is the most difficult? Of course, the biggest difficulty was getting the cows to enter the robot. It was a gradual process. At first, we simply made them pass through the robot. We didn't close it, didn't give them any food, nothing. We just made them pass through for an entire week, even during the early hours. Then, when we saw they were more accustomed, we started giving them food inside. 
We noticed that some were more interested, coming to the front, and so on. After about 10 more days, we started closing them in and providing food. After about 20 days of adaptation, we began using the robot. It was very smooth. Even the company staff was surprised at how calm the cows were. I believe that has a significant influence on the adaptation, that the cows are calm. And did you have an increase in milk production? Yes, there was an increase. When we started in the barn, here in the confinement, we had an average of about 28 liters. Before the robot arrived, we had already increased by four to five liters on average, just by keeping the cows here in the barn. Then we started with robotic milking and it increased by another three to four liters. So we went from 28 to 38 liters. That's all. Now let's visit the farm and thank you very much for your participation with us. Now we are with the farm technician, the nutritionist, and he will take this moment to talk a little about the feeding area, how the animals are fed, what the diet is, and what strategies are used to increase milk production. Today, we provide the diet in the feeding area twice a day, around two and a half, three in the afternoon, and in the morning at five and a half, six hours in the morning. This feeding area is cleaned every morning and the feed residue is measured to partially assess the diet. Most of the concentrate nowadays covers 70 to 80% of the diet, which is provided on the feeding track. Here in this system, we have two production groups, one of multi-paris cows and another of primi-paris cows. Why did we choose this? We only had one robot operating and had multi-paris and primi-paris cows together, so it was a bit crowded and we had very low milking from the primiparis cows, with only two milkings. Now, with two robots, we have separated a group of primiparis cows and another of multiparis cows, increasing the multiparis cows to 3.3 milkings and the primiparis cows to 3.7 milkings per day. This has resulted in a gratifying increase in milk production compared to the number of milkings. Today, production will decrease a bit when we work with the system at full capacity. We are a bit anxious with the robots, but next year, when the reproduction cycle begins, we will work with the system at full capacity. I started taking care of this robot a year and six months ago, exactly when it started. The diet is practically the same as before. The main difference is that we don't use cottonseed, but pre-dried Tifton hay, as the producer has pigs and fertile irrigation. So, we managed to make good pre-dried hay. And what were the challenges you faced? when you started formulating diets for the cows with the robotic milking system? The biggest challenge we face today on the property, as I mentioned, are the three years of drought and, over the past year and a half, the fluctuation in the dry matter content of the silo. Many times we buy corn from outside, resulting in one part of the silo having high dry matter, for example 40%, and another part having 35%. We have to adjust and balance the cow's intake. This is the main challenge today. 80% of the management, which involves the nutritionist technician and the producer. Everyone needs to understand the diet a little bit for it to work well. And to formulate these diets, what system do you use? How do you go about formulating the diets for these cows? I practically work with two systems, NASEM 2021 and also MTS. So I use both, evaluating the diet itself and trying to correct it in the best possible way, adjusting the starch, fiber, crude protein, NDF, according to the raw materials being used today. The concentrate is practically the same as in the other diet. It contains extruded soybeans, protected fat, corn, soybean hulls, and soybean meal. These raw materials are viable here at a good price and are cost effective. Do you also use the Penn State particle separator here? We use the Penn State particle separator mainly in this system to evaluate the quality of the mixer wagon blend, the mixing time. We evaluate every five meters of the feed bunk take a sample of around 400 grams and pass it through the separator to see the coefficient of variation, the standard deviation of the wagon, and how the mix is. This process is done at each monthly visit by the nutritionist. And what would happen if you didn't have a tool like this to work with? I'll give a simple example. If we load the silo into the wagon and go with what comes out of the silo, that's what we provide as a diet. Cow 570 is consuming a certain amount of concentrate at one end of the feed bunk, and if she moves to the other end, she will eat a different type of diet. The variation is large, and the cow needs consistency. She needs food at the exact time, comfort, and consistency. The most important thing for the cow is consistency, regardless of the management. And what happens to production when consistency is lost? 
When consistency is lost, it's like saying that a cow consumed a certain amount of concentrate at the beginning of the feed bunk and another amount at the end, constantly challenging them. If we make a mistake in the amount and they consume more concentrate, surpassing the amount of forage, they can suffer from clinical acidosis. This cow will take 14 days to recover the milk production she had today. If she was producing 40 liters, it will drop to 30, and it will take about 15 days to get back to 40 liters, because we are dealing with living microorganisms in the rumen, cellulolytic and amylolytic bacteria that need at least 14 days to proliferate and reach their optimal production state. Regarding knowledge, how did you learn to work with dairy cow nutrition? I gained knowledge through courses, specializations, postgraduate studies, and courses at Santa Fe Agro Instituto. By reading more and more, searching for articles, and trying to bring what is in the literature to the real life of the producer. And what do you think was lost due to not having the knowledge when the robot arrived? Because being something very new, many times we don't have that knowledge. It's a system in which we are all learning. If you had had that knowledge before, many things could have been avoided. What would those things be? The main loss is in milk production and management because until we learn to work with the cow, which is a single animal, the diet, the concentrate in the robot, and how it influences, the screw speed, the amount that falls, you learn and face difficulties. I believe that when we don't know how to work, we lose at least three liters per cow. We can't take full advantage because we change every week, every 15 days, and that's not good for the cow. And what about heat stress? Heat stress is a severe problem here. We are in February and the drought is decreasing. We have a temperature of 33 degrees to give you an idea. The northwest of Rio Grande do Sul is the worst place to milk cows because morning temperatures are around 18 degrees Celsius. But during the day and late afternoon, they reach a maximum of 35 degrees Celsius. On very hot days, the temperature can reach 45 degrees Celsius, often with very high air humidity, which causes great heat stress in the cows. You can see here that at 3 in the afternoon, these cows would be lying down if it were a cooler winter climate. They are on the track to cool down. It's not that they are being forced to come here, it's that they had heat stress and came to cool off. It's easier not to let the cow's temperature rise than to lower it afterward, right? It's much easier. We try to prevent the cow from getting hot, but unfortunately, it's a challenge with a robotic system. If we take all the cows to the track, we prevent them from lying down, which goes against their nature. There is a limit to how long a cow can lie down, because for every extra hour she spends lying down, she produces 1.6 liters more milk. So we evaluate the best management for each property. The main difference here between compost and freestall is that management is easier, bed cleaning can be done at any time of the day, and the cows can be close to the system. Unlike with compost, where I need two people to move the cows and manage them better. And how do you think this management knowledge can contribute to milk production? As I mentioned, 80% of milk comes from management. If we don't study and understand the cows, it's difficult because, for example, we face daily situations. Sometimes the diet is correct in the computer, but there's a variation in the cow's feces, which could be due to a mistake in mixing, more concentrate, or more silage. So, management must always be in order. Today, management is the foundation of everything. It's a pleasure. I'm Andressa Binsfeld. I'm a veterinarian, and I work in the field of nutrition. We are here at the Heck family farm. They chose the free stall system where the cows have the space we consider ideal. In this way, they defecate outside the bedding, which makes cleaning management much easier. Cleaning is done twice a day. Manure is removed from the bedding, the bedding is replenished, and lime is used once a day to sterilize the bedding and the area where the cow's udders will be. It is sterilized to reduce the bacterial load, which is a form of cleaning. In the compost system, we work with bedding turning twice a day. In a robotic milking system, you always have these cows on the compost system. You have to adapt to do this turning with a tractor, working with the cows inside the system. Here you can clean as long as there are no cows lying on the beds. And what challenges did you face when you started formulating diets for cows in a robotic milking system? I think the biggest challenge was knowledge. We were working with TMR and we had the idea that the diet had to be complete. Then we switched to a partial diet. We started working with 60, 75% of the diet on the track with all the forage and a concentrate in the robot. This is very good, especially when we can't have batch separations due to physical limitations. We separate them in the robot itself. Thus, they receive the amount of concentrate in the robot according to their DM, days in milk, 
postpartum cows or according to their production. We adapted this to each system, but that was our biggest challenge. Transitioning from a TMR system to a PMR system, something we were not used to. And how do you seek knowledge today? We mainly seek knowledge through courses. I believe the courses offered by Santa Fe Agro Instituto are of great value, bringing in professors who have worked with this for many years. In Canada and the United States, robotic milking is no longer new. It is a reality. So we seek out those courses, articles, and postgraduate studies, always looking for knowledge to bring the best to the producer. What would be your reference today in robotic milking? In terms of articles and studies, what do you like to read that provides you with knowledge? I closely follow the people from Canada. We know there is a lot of research on robots, and many of the online lectures by Mike Hootjens, as well as books by Mike himself, talk a bit about robotic milking. The NASM book also has a section on robotics. These are our references today, in addition to colleagues. I always say that nothing is more important than the experience of a colleague working in the field. It is very important. The cows are on free stall bedding, move to the robotic milking system, and have two options. If they are authorized for milking, each cow has its authorization and milking time. For example, postpartum cows here have authorization every three hours to go for milking. They pass through the selection gate, which directs them either to the feeding track, the handling track, or the waiting area where they go for milking. At the selection gate, if they are authorized, they go to the waiting area and then to the robot for milking, where they receive the concentrate and are milked. After milking, they move to the feeding track, where they receive feed and then are free to return to the bedding. The Heck family barn currently has space for 140 cows. Currently, they do not have all 140 cows in milking, but they want to grow, which is why they work with two robots. They have two milking robots. This is the second robot, which does not have a panel today. It is a farm option not to have the panel, but it captures all the information. The first robot has the panel, where we can see various things about the cow, how much she produces per teat, how much she has produced in total for the day, and over the past seven days. All this information can be found on this panel. Something very important on the farm is the milk diversion. We know that cows that have some illness and will be treated with antibiotics for some reason are entered into the diversion. So in the system, we can record the reason for the illness, what antibiotic we are using, how many days it will be used, and the withdrawal period. This milk is automatically diverted. Those are the diversions we find there in the corner. Similarly, colostrum from newly calved cows goes into diversion, and three or four days postpartum, transition milk also goes into diversion and not into the tank. When the cow enters the milking booth, the first process is the application of pre-dipping. After the application, each teat is individually cleaned. Then the teat cup is placed on each teat. Milking is performed, and then the teat cups are removed according to the production of each teat. After milking, post-dipping is applied, and the cow is free to go to the feeding track, on the panel, the production of each teat during milking is shown, among other information provided. Here we can adjust the size of the cow in the milking. It is automatically adjusted, but if necessary, I can make the adjustment. Here is all the cleaning part of the robot, the schedules, the water temperature, and all the information about the animal being milked. Hello, my name is Gustavo Flores Zielinski. I am a veterinarian with a postgraduate degree in dairy cattle nutrition. Whenever we seek knowledge about robotic milking in AMS systems, nutrition, or management, we find references to Dr. Trevor, a Canadian who is one of the leading researchers in the world. It is a unique opportunity for Santa Fe Agro Instituto to bring you an online course. Take advantage of this opportunity.